You've just finished describing in your tech noir game how the evil cyborg clone of Jet Li has leapt through the warehouse window, sending a cascade of glittering glass across the oil-soaked floor. He lands in a perfect three-point stance. You pause, but the players don't immediately respond. Okay, uh, let's keep talking. Uh, Cyborg Jet Li somersaults forward and, and raises his arm. The, the flesh peels back, revealing a machine gun. Oh god, uh, still nothing? Uh, okay, so, so the machine gun fires, spraying the room with bullets. Uh, then the cyborg dashes behind a forklift for cover. Uh, then he shouts out, Your deaths are all part of the program. Th then he summons a couple of attack drones, which come flying in through the window. And then, and then, and then... This is something I call fearing the silence. The GM finishes describing something and pauses, but there's not an immediate response from the players. The silence, however, fleeting is like a vacuum, and the GM feels compelled to fill it. So they start talking again. And what can they possibly talk about? Well, whatever would happen next, right? I've just got to keep talking. From the GM's perspective, either consciously or subconsciously, the players aren't engaged with the game. If they were engaged, they'd be declaring an action. But they aren't which means the GM has done something wrong. So the GM has to do something, that they have to say something. They, they have to get the players engaged again. Oh God, it, it's all going horribly wrong. What, what can I do? I've got to do something, uh, do something, do something. Just, just keep doing things. But what's actually happening is that the players are being boxed out. They can't make declarations about what they're doing. So it stops feeling like they're interacting with the world and starts feeling like they're just watching the GM perform it. This can then become a cascading problem. As the players are forced into becoming a passive audience, they, they lose the momentum they need to interact with the world. Once that happens, it can take a moment for them to figuratively get up out of their chairs and back on stage again, for them to start taking action. But that moment they need to sort of reconnect to the game and get rolling again is a moment of silence. And the GM is still nervously filling it before the players can get going, pushing them even farther into passivity. You can actually create a similar problem through freeze frame boxed text, where the GM starts reading the box text and then the PCs are frozen in place while a bunch of stuff happens. These can get really elaborate with entire scenes being played through while the players just sit impotently boxed out, pun intended, from the actual game. Here's a simpler example, though, from the journeys through the Radiant Citadel. Grasping weeds and vines erupt from the cobblestone street beneath the carriage at the head of the parade. The ox pulling the cart panics, causing the vehicle to careen into a post covered in decorations. Uh, the vegetation then wraps around the cart's wheels and the closest bystanders. A, a pair of revelers produce weapons, revealing themselves to be guards protecting the Prince of Vice. As soon as the players hear grasping weeds and vines erupt from the cobblestone street, they'll want to respond to that. Instead, everyone else in the scene, in including the ox, gets to react before they do. Now, the problem here isn't that the GM is using boxed text. When used properly to clearly indicate the information players should have about a scene or location, boxed text and similar techniques can be a very efficient and effective form of prep. For example, consider this example from Describe, the sponsors of today's video. A lattice of silvery white metal, artfully crafted into the shape of a spider web, arcs low over a sarcophagus of black marble polished to a high sheen. The lattice is moored to marble posts, and atop it stands a spider as big as a cat. From its mandibles dangles a thin gold chain, at the end of which hangs a red gem as thick as your thumb. This is great boxed text. To understand the difference, to understand why the first example was bad and the one by Matt Cernet for Describe was good, it can be useful to realize that you can get an almost identical problem without any box text at all. In fact, bottomless improv can happen specifically because you don't have anything prepped. Maybe the players have gone to a location I didn't anticipate, so I'm creating it on the spot. As I describe the location, I keep getting cool new ideas, so I just keep talking. There's this, and this, oh, and you see somebody doing this, oh, and somebody else doing this, and there's also this other thing, and also, and then the first guy does this other thing, and then the game world is infinitely detailed. It exists far beyond the capacity for the single audio channel of the GM's voice to convey or describe in its entirety. So if you get into a creative groove, you will never run out of new things to describe. You are once again stuck in a loop, and the players are once again boxed out. 
Now, whether you're improvising NPC actions, writing box text, or improvising the description of a scene, what you want to do is identify the reaction point, the point at which something happens that the PCs will want to react to, and then you need to stop talking. Imagine that you're playing your favorite character and listen to this GM describe a scene. With a sharp crack of splintering wood, the door smashes open, revealing five goblins who whip their heads in your direction. The room is about 40 feet across. The, the high, curved walls are lined with built-in shelves of cherry wood filled with books and warmly lit by a crystal chandelier that hangs from the middle of the domed ceiling. The goblins have been ripping books off the shelves. At what point in that description did you have an impulse to take action? Your mileage may vary, but I'll bet it was as soon as the GM mentioned the goblins. So let's take a different look at that same scene. With a sharp crack of splintering wood, the door smashes open, revealing a room about 40 feet across. The high, curved walls are lined with built-in shelves of cherry wood filled with books and warmly lit by a crystal chandelier that hangs from the middle of the dome ceiling. Five goblins are ripping books off the shelves, but their heads whip in your direction. What do you do? Did you feel the difference? Did your impulse for action come at the very moment that the GM stopped talking so you could take that action? Now, your descriptions at the game table are an artistic expression, and the given circumstances of any particular moment at the game table are limitless, so there will be a bajillion and one hypothetical exceptions to any general principles we might discuss. But at least nine times out of ten, it boils down to recognizing the reaction point and then immediately letting the players react to it. This can create results that seem counterintuitive to human perception, or even contrary to what you might see in a novel or short story. If you opened a door and saw a slavering beast, all of your attention would be immediately focused on the monster. You would not take time to notice the bookshelves first. In a novel, on the other hand, an author could easily introduce the threat of the monster and then keep the reader in suspense by describing the scene. But we're not reading a novel. We're playing a role-playing game. It's a unique medium, and the techniques that will make you the most effective as a game master will often be unique, too. In this case, the actual experience of the character is to see the slavering beast and immediately react to it. That's the adrenaline-pumping, fight-or-flight crisis response you need to capture if you're going to immerse your players into that scene. You don't want to blunt that reaction by forcing them to wait until you finish describing the rest of the room. Okay, sure, but can't we just resolve this dilemma by not describing the room? I mean, the characters would focus on the slavering monster, so let's focus on the slavering monster. With a sharp crack of splintering wood, the door smashes open, revealing five goblins. Their heads whip in your direction. Unfortunately, this ignores the limited bandwidth of information the players have about the game world. Although the character may be immediately fixated on the goblins, their peripheral vision is immediately processing the environment. Where are the exits? Where can they hide? How far away are the goblins? How can they attack? Not only can they take in the totality of their sensorium, they can also take action while simultaneously continuing to observe their environment. The players can't do that. As they communicate their intended actions to you, they're monopolizing the same channel of information that you'd use to give them more details about the environment. So one of two things will then happen. Either first, the players will recognize the problem and start asking questions. Are there any obstacles that would stop me from charging them? Do, do I see anything I can take cover behind? Or second, without understanding the environment, they'll take nonsensical actions. Now, for example, uh, you didn't mention the giant chasm that runs across the room between them and the rabid mammoth, so now they're charging straight into it, even though that would obviously be a ridiculous thing for their characters to do. Uh, this will, of course, force you to stop them and correct them. Now, in either case, you've still blunted the reaction point with additional environmental description. You've just made it more awkward, too. Okay, so the players need a coherent understanding of the environment in which they are taking action, and you need to position the reaction point in the most effective way possible. To do this, another useful tip is to set yourself a description limit. What's the maximum number of things you can describe before you need to stop talking? This isn't a hard or fast rule, but I recommend three to five, and almost never more than seven. Of course, you don't need to describe that many things. If you describe three things and that's everything you need to set the scene, great, you're done. Now, this limit can feel constraining, but there are a few things to keep in mind that will help. First, at the beginning of a scene, whether that's a new location or a new situation, start broad and then go specific. You've given yourself a budget, and you'll want to make sure the players know they're in a forest before you start describing the individual trees. Second, 
Identify the reaction point before you start the description. Then aim your description at the reaction point. At a bare minimum, when you've spent your entire budget except for the reaction point, arbitrarily stop describing things and cut to the reaction point. Uh, for example, once you've said four things describing the hotel room, it's time to mention the ogre with the gun and see what happens. If you identify multiple reaction points in a scene, what you'll usually want to do is prioritize them. Present the first, let the PCs react to it, and then present the second. I also think of these as actionable chunks. Uh, grasping weeds and vines erupting from the cobblestones is one actionable chunk. The ox pulling the cart panicking, causing it to careen into a post, is another actionable chunk. The vegetation wrapping around the cartwheels and the nearest bystanders is another chunk, and so forth. I use the word actionable here because you're specifically looking for actions you can take as a GM, allowing the players to have reactions to each of those actions. Now, sometimes there might be two reaction points that are truly happening simultaneously. Uh, the ogre pulls a gun at the very moment that kobold ninjas leap in through the window. That's fine. It'll just chew up more of your budget, since you'll need to describe both reaction points. This actually creates a natural corollary in which, generally speaking, the more complicated the stuff happening in the scene is, the simpler the setting of the scene should be. Finally, remember that description can persist through the entire scene. You don't need to describe every single detail of the hotel room before the PCs react to the ogre pulling her gun. You may not have had time to describe the lamp, but as Antoine rushes forward to knock the gun out of the ogre's hand, you can then describe how the, the sickly light flickering out through the cigarette-stained lampshade throws his shadow garishly across the far wall. And maybe you haven't described what can be seen outside the window, but as more kobold ninjas swing through it, you'll have the chance to mention the billboard declaring Mayor Thomas's re-election campaign on the building across the street. This is particularly useful if you find yourself bubbling over with bottomless improv. You don't need to discard all those cool ideas that are sparking in your imagination. You just need to hit the pause button on them, drop the reaction point, and then look for the opportunity to weave them into the carnage that follows. This is, of course, something that you can practice, too. You can make it a practice point by writing it on a post-it note and attaching it to your GM screen. You might write something like, one, identify the reaction point, two, five details, three, start broad, then specific, four, keep describing, or even just reaction point in big, bold text. Having that post-it note on your screen will put it in your peripheral vision throughout the session, creating a persistent reminder of what you want to focus on. This is also a skill you can practice away from the table with a simple exercise using Describe, the sponsor of today's video. Describe offers interactive maps, an incredible sonic library, and lush descriptions created by an incredible team of professional RPG designers. This includes a large selection of pre-written box text, a lot of which you can access for free. As an exercise, follow the sponsored link to Describe in the uh, font of all knowledge down below and look through their box text. Think about where the reaction point is in each example. Does the description get it right? If not, how would you rearrange the text to get the maximum effect from the reaction point? Is there something you could add to make it better? Or take away? This might also be a great time to check out So You Want to Be a Game Master, my new book on GMing coming from Macmillan and Page Street Publishing this fall. You'll find a link with more information on that in the uh, font of all knowledge, too. But in the broader scope, the big solution to all of these problems that we're talking about is to simply care about what your players are doing. Minimize the mindset of the story you're trying to tell, or, or even the world you're trying to immerse them in. Your NPCs should be awesome, but they are not ultimately the stars of your campaign. The mindset you want to emphasize, in my opinion, is, I want to see what the PCs do. I'm having an ogre draw her gun because I want to see how the players react to that, and I want to see how I react to what they do. I can have a lot of fun playing around with all the cool lair actions the Lich King can take, but ultimately the point of the Lich King encounter is for the PCs to confront him. It can be a subtle shift in thought, but when your primary focus becomes, ooh, I wonder what this will make them do, you will never forget to give them the opportunity to do it. Good gaming. I'm Justin Alexander, and I'll see you at the table.